Uh, so here's uh, Paris Buckfield Addison. He's going to be telling us about uh, functional programming in the recently open sourced Swift language. So, Paris, thank you. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you for indulging me with Swift. It is open source now. We do belong here. <laughs> I am. I've been in bed for the last two days with a migraine, so if I look like I'm about to pass out, I may be about to pass out. So if anyone wants to jump up here and finish the presentation if that happens, they're more than welcome to. Other than that, we should be fine. I am a game developer by trade. I, I run a company called Secret Lab. Uh, we've been working with Swift from a long time. Uh, and we write a lot of books. Most of them lately are about Swift. This is the most recent one we've written. We've just finished it and we're really proud of it. It's completely useless to you if you care about functional programming because we do not cover it at all. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be talking about a number of things related to Swift, uh, why you should care about it. I'm basically going to go quickly through the basics of functional programming with Swift. I'm not going to go into things like monads and currying and all the exciting things you've been talking about all day. Despite having a PhD in computer science, I cannot confidently explain any of those things. <laughs> this is mostly a how Swift does it talk. Uh, I want to give you a quick overview, nothing more. So let's have a quick look at Swift. Swift is one of those newfangled modern languages that everyone likes to talk about. And we think it's pretty good. It is really nice, it is really clean, and hopefully you guys will hopefully play with it at some point. Um, I think there's a, quite a few reasons why Swift matters. Primarily, it's now open source. It's not just a source dump, which Apple has been egregiously responsible for in the past when open sourcing things. It is actually an actively maintained, very well documented open source project that encourages contributions of all kinds, ranging from code to documentation and everything in between. But it's also very easy to teach. There is an Apple supported curriculum and teacher's guide, and it's a very expressive, simple, fast language to learn and teach and work with. I'm biased, but I also think one of the great reasons to work with Swift is the iOS platform. It's everywhere. It's not the biggest market by volume, but it is by revenue. So if you're a game developer like me, it's a really great place to be. There's heaps of great material for teaching Swift, but perhaps most importantly, Swift fully supports emoji. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, in fact, do anything you like with emoji in Swift. It's great. You literally supports it everywhere. This is actually really great for programming with uh, medical uses because you can use all the superscripts and subscripts and stuff that Unicode supports correctly, which means your code reads like the thing you're actually trying to describe. So it doesn't just support emoji, it supports full Unicode, everything. Now, I want to get it out of the way up front. Script is certainly not a functional language in the slightest. Um, but as hopefully everyone here knows, doing this floorboard is really creaky. I'm going to move here. Doing functional programming doesn't require a functional language. Um, no matter what language you use, programming in a functional style is a really useful, beneficial thing to do uh, when convenient. Uh, it's nothing like a pure functional language. It is nothing like Haskell. Uh, but it's not just an object-oriented language either. It's not really religious. It, it tries to be very pragmatic that takes the best bits of other languages and puts them all together into kind of a useful stew um, in a coherent way. So that said, all the ideals that make functional programming awesome are really important in Swift. Um, the stuff that makes functional programming great is the cornerstone of Swift's vision. Immutability is not just a convention for collections. Everything in Swift should be immutable by default. Um, we declare variables with the let keyword. We only when necessary by semantics do we change it to a var variable that we can actually fiddle with. Um, objects are not so prevalent in the code anymore. Most types in Swift are values, things like that. Um, functions in Swift are a first class type, so on, so on. So it does really take a lot of functional stuff to heart, which is really great. So I promised in the description that I would talk about installing Swift. And to my credit, I did attempt to set up a Linux VM, but it has been far too long since I properly use Linux. So we're going to look at it on slides instead. If you are on OS X, you can just install Xcode from the Mac App Store and you will get the latest Swift and everything will work beautifully. If you're on Linux, there are binaries available for Ubuntu and you can build it from source. It is very easy to install it. You just app get some bits and pieces and then untar that thing and you've basically got Swift and it works. It works really, really well. Magic. If you're a Mac user and you want to play with the latest Swift stuff from the Swift Open Source Project, Xcode lets you switch between tool chains at your will. So you can install the open source project alongside the Swift that comes with Xcode. They're not very different right now, but they will be. There's a whole bunch of really cool Swifty things that are useful to you when you're actually developing Swift. If you're in a Mac user, 
There's this thing called a playground, which is a REPL, a read, evaluate, print loop, but in GUI form, you can assign uh, objects to have a visible output and it will draw them on the side of the screen as you write them. It's basically like IPython, but a million times prettier. Uh, it's really, really cool. If you're on Linux, Swift includes a command line REPL. Somebody should really build a GUI for this at some point. It would be great. Uh, hopefully you can read the blue text. There, that is the command line though. So hopefully you all know functional programming, but I'm gonna review the basics again, just because. We all know what functions are. Code goes in a function. You call the function. Maybe you pass it some parameters. Maybe you get back a value. The idea is that functions can be a value just like numbers and strings. You can stick them in variables, pass them as parameters, and receive them as return values, so on and so on. Higher order functions is just a fancy term for functions that work with other functions. <laughs> Quite good. Pure functions are functions that have no side effects. They do nothing except take parameters and return a value. Change no memory, they do no IO. Pure functions should have no side effect. They should only compute the value and return it. Uh, this means you can't do IO without being subtle about it anyway. Uh, so why does functional programming matter? After all, monads are hard. Why should we try and do it? Uh, this guy's John. He made a little thing called Doom. He made a little thing called Quake. Back in the, I am a game developer, so my examples will be game-centric, I'm sorry. Here's what he said at one point. So I'm not gonna read it because it's bad, but functional programming is good for this sort of reason. And yeah, okay, but why does it provide benefits? Well, pure functions have a lot of nice properties. This is a quote from John Carmack's article uh, a lot, and we quote from it a lot here because he gave a really clear and practical reason for why functional programming matters. And there's some really good reasons. Thread safety, reusability, testability, understandability, maintainability. These are all really good reasons. So Swift, as I said, has several really good functional programming features. Um, they're not actually needed to develop in functional programming style, but it makes it so much easier to have these. First one of these is a really nice type system. And we'll come back to that in a moment, but I'm just gonna leave it sitting there for a moment. First class functions, of course, really important. It means that functions are values just like numbers and strings. If functions are values, functions can be passed as parameters and returned by other functions. Sounds simple. If it's not everywhere, it doesn't really work. So let's define a simple little function that takes two ints and adds them and returns them. We'll add a, I'll declare a variable and say that it stores a function that takes two ints and returns an int. We can now assign the add function to this variable and this variable can be called. Not bad, really. Closures make things so much easier. Closures are basically inline functions, but with a nicer syntax for doing it. Remember how we made the add function a couple of slides back? Here's the same thing, but as a closure. So you might be thinking, okay, what's the difference? Uh, as we'll see, they're a really nice expressive way to work with functions. As an aside, Swift's type system will actually infer as much as it can from what you give it. So we can remove the type specifiers entirely, and Swift is able to figure out we're adding two things and returning an int, so therefore the parameters are quite likely to be ints. It's quite useful. We could remove the type specifiers and the return type as well. Since when you add two ints together, you'll probably want an int. You could even just be lazy and define the type of one parameter, and that's enough to infer from as well. To save some typing, you could also omit the return keyword if the closure only contains a single statement. You can omit the parameter names too, which is nice. Uh, so if you notice here, we're defining add to simply be a variable that contains a function that takes two ints and returns an int. When we provide the closure itself, Swift actually uses the variable's type information to bind the parameter's types. You could be even lazier and take advantage of the fact that add has already been defined. Here we're just saying that the add function is the plus operator. That's extreme laziness, but it works. Closures also capture values that they use. So here's an example. We're gonna define a new type called adder, which is a function that takes a single int and returns an int. We'll make a function that returns a closure Notice how this closure uses the number parameter. The closure is actually capturing the parameter. You can now make, call make adder, passing a two, and we get, that a fun, get back a function that adds two to the number you pass in. And then we can actually use it, and it works. It's all pretty straightforward. So having first class functions means that we actually get higher order functions too, and this is even more useful. So we'll have a look at an example of this as well. Define a type of a function that takes an int and returns an int. We'll make a function that takes two numbers and another function to use them with. 
make a function called add, which is a two integer function, which adds two parameters together. We can now pass this add function as the parameter to apply operator with numbers. And we can also pass the plus operator as the parameter since it fits the signature. Two ints go in, one int comes out. Fairly straightforward. Next thing I want to quickly talk about is optionals, which are another really useful feature in Swift. Optionals that you represent any value that may be nil. So in Swift, variables are never allowed to be nil unless they're optionals. This is really quite useful if you've ever had to do with nil in the past. Let's take a quick look at an example of that. Uh, when we have a string, we can do operations on that string. This will always work because text will always have a value. It will never not have a value. This text is from the internet. But if we try and do operations on a string we get back from uh, load text from disk, it might fail. We can't blindly use the value it returns. We don't actually know we can actually load something from the disk. This is very similar to uh, maybe in Haskell, which is pretty cool. And here we're using the question mark operator to unwrap the optional, revealing its contents. So if text from disk has a value, the expression continues evaluating, we call uppercase string. Uh, if not, the expression immediately uh, evaluates to nil. So I'm going to go through a, quick more, a, a few quick, more contrived examples using Swift. This is a pretty classical functional programming example. Uh, we've got a function that takes an array of integers and returns a new array where everything is incremented by one. This is how you might do it traditionally. We might also need a function that takes an array and doubles everything in it, so there's the doubling array. The two previous functions obviously share a lot of code. Uh, so there's no reason we couldn't abstract the differences and make a single function that takes an array of integers and a function which tells it what to do as the parameter. This means we can take the first two functions and rewrite them as simple one-line functions that call our new manipulate array function, which is not too bad. This has some limitations. We can easily transform array of ints into another array of ints, which is sometimes useful, I guess. But what if we want to take an array of integers and compute an array of booleans, indicating whether an item is even or odd or something like that? So the current manipulator array function will give us an error if we tried to do this. Um, big tenant of functional programming is writing duplicate versions of things sucks, so we could just keep making new versions of these functions that do different things, but it doesn't really scale or epitomize how functional programming should work. What if we need to work with strings in the future? Then we might have to do something else. We can solve this with generics, so we don't have to keep making higher order functions. Take our original manipulate array function and stick a type definition in front of it. We can now provide functions that convert ints to any type. So each type T you work with essentially gives us a new function to use here. We can actually take this further. Hopefully, those people who do a lot of functional programming know where this is going. Here we've introduced another element, another type element. So now we can work with an array of any type. That's nicer obviously, because we can do things like that. Using Swift's extension feature, we can add the map method into every array. It doesn't have to be a function on its own anymore. Swift conventions suggest we should define our map uh, as an extension to array, so that's what we're doing here. I'm not going to go into extensions here, but they're super, super useful. So now we can do nice and simple things like that. Now, hopefully you realize map actually comes with Swift. It's part of Swift standard library. It's defined on the sequence type protocol. I'm not going to go into protocols here, but if you know functional programming, you'll know what I'm, where I'm going with that. I, I just went through what map does, so you know there's no real magic behind map. And Swift works pretty much how you'd expect in that respect. Another nice thing you can do uh, when functions are first-class citizens is compose functions from other functions. So let's say we've got two functions. One doubles an integer. The other adds one to an integer. We can run an int through both of them and get back a result. So, got two there. It goes through, it comes out, you've got a result. And again, same thing. But we could also combine the two functions together. That way we only have to call one function. So instead of calling two, we now call one and get back what we'd expect. Here's how we do it. So we create a function composed that takes two functions and returns a new function that combines them. We're using generics here. This means that compose will work with any function type. 
as long as the input and return type of both functions are the same thing. So now we can compose a double and add-on function for the two separate fun from the two separate functions. There they are. Pretty straightforward. We're using some Swift shorthand in the middle there. And actually use them. Fairly straightforward. This requires two methods that have the same types, which is a limitation of that. Function A needs to take a T and return a T. Function B needs to have exact same signature. This kind of sucks. Uh, what if function A needs to return a different type? Well, let's take another look at a pair of functions. In this case, the first function takes an int but returns a bool, and the second function takes a bool and returns a bool. It's pretty hit clear how these two functions could be composed together, uh, but we need to update our compose method to do it. No. Let's update compose and have a quick look at that. Here we've made a version of Compose that works with three types. The input type of function A, the return type of function A, which has to be the same as the input of function B, and the return type of function B. Uh, the body of the Compose method hasn't actually changed at all. The only difference thing is we've introduced new types. So Compose can now return a function that has the input type of function A and the return type of function B, but we can use the same Compose uh, two functions together with different types. The only requirement is that function A's return type is the same as function B's input type. So hopefully it's fairly straightforward. I've actually breezed through this, so I'm going to quickly talk about some third-party libraries out there to help. My favourite of these is SwiftZ or SwiftZ, SwiftZ, depending on which language you speak, I guess. Uh, it includes a whole bunch of really cool stuff, primarily to make working with collections and lists easier. Um, there are a lot of third-party languages, third-party language extensions available for Swift now. A lot of them were unfortunately written for Swift 1.2 and 1.1, which is now evolved into Swift 2. SwiftZ is one of the few that's actually updated properly. Essentially, it contains better types and tools to support functional programming. As I mentioned, Swift isn't really a functional programming language. It just happens to do it really well. So SwiftZ adds types like arrows, lists, hlists, things like that, that you might be used to from other functional programming languages. Um, and it does this because of Swift's amazing type system. So here you can see SwiftZ converting a list of integers into an infinitely cycling list and performing a map reduce filter operation on it, carrying the plus operator and providing and take and drop for collections. It's, it's lots of really cool stuff. The other ones that are updated and that we actually have used are Promisum, which adds promises to the Swift language, which lets you return values but in the future. Uh, I'm not going to go into that today, but maybe that's a talk in the future. It's really cool. Uh, dollar.swift, which is a whole bunch of other useful stuff, and result, which is success and failure result types for Swift. So I have a, a quick few recommendations of where to learn more of this sort of stuff. I'm sure you've been through similar things in the earlier talks, but all the Haskell tutorials are really great places to start learning functional programming with Swift, because Swift has taken so much of its uh, functional programming ideology from Haskell. And Apple's also got a really great book called the Swift Book, and IBM, has really embraced Swift with their partnership through Apple and is releasing a whole bunch of great documentation as well as a virtualized Swift sandbox host in Linux that you can play with online there. I can't remember what it's called, but it's really cool. So I've actually got 10 minutes left, according to my clock. If anyone has any questions or wants to tweet me, they're welcome to. Thank you. How do we do the questions? Who wants to start? Ron. 99% of the value of a programming language is the libraries that are available mm -hmm. to solve problems so you don't have to do it all yourself. Uh, what happens to something like Swift? <laughs> For functional programming or in general? Both. Uh, so in general, uh, sorry, yeah, I can repeat the question. So language support for libraries and stuff that does useful stuff. Ron suggested that most of the good stuff comes in the, the libraries that you use alongside the language. Um, as far as building apps, you can't really do anything with Swift unless you're on OS X or iOS right now because it's all tied to Cocoa and Cocoa Touch. If you want to play around with the language, that's what you can do right now. And there are a lot of people working on frameworks that will make Swift useful for building server apps that should be ready within three to six months. People have really started to embrace the language in a surprisingly large way, and I would expect that to continue. But right now, if you want to do a lot, you really have to be on OS X. Does that kind of answer it? Yeah. That's changing for sure, though. Guy in the middle. Um, with the, when you back box slides and you yep. have composing multiple functions together, um, is there a way you can do like a bar? 
<laughs> I believe there is, yes, but I can't remember off the top of my head how you do that. Yeah, but there is. Uh, composing varags to actually get into the function of the thing, yeah. Yes, so it is a compiled language. Um, it's good, it's getting better. It's not great yet, though. It will get better. Um, in terms of what people in your open source ecosystem are using Swift for, when people are writing libraries, are they writing them in a uh, functional programming friendly way? I know that in Java, it's a big where so much of the community libraries in Java that it's sort of object here, it won't play nice with functional programming. Is there a similar issue with Swift? Um, I think there is, yes. So the previous big Apple language that the same communities picked up was Objective-C, which is very object-oriented and not very functional at all. Kind of hard to do proper functional programming with. So they're still kind of following that pattern. But things are changing, and there's a lot of really good libraries that are starting to come out that work with Swift. Swift's entire philosophy really embraces a lot of stuff that is fundamental to functional programming. So the Apple community is very good at taking that to heart and working with it. And there's a whole bunch of really cool open source frameworks appearing that look like they're heading in the right direction. Right now, anyway. Anyone else? Go back. Where was that, sorry? In the composing unit one. Yeah, it's comma underscore function. All right, uh, yeah. Come and chat with me afterwards, I'll explain to you. It's, it's a bit <laughs> irrelevant to functional programming. <laughs> yep. So, memory <laughs> so it's, it's automatic reference counting, which is taken care of for you, basically. It, it's reference counting, yeah. You don't have to think about it, it won't halt and do a garbage collection, but. You, <laughs> you do have to know how memory management works to do it properly, basically. You can't just ignore it. I believe it's just naive reference counting, but I'm not sure. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>